Good morning. I'm Tracy Erconan, and I am your lay leader today. Welcome to this time of sharing and worship. If you are a guest this morning, we are glad you are here. Please take time to complete the communications and prayer request form. The forms will be collected during service, and all prayers will be lifted up today and remembered throughout the week. And join us for refreshments after worship in the East Room. You're welcome to make use of our family worship room located just outside the sanctuary in the West Wing, and the service is broadcast in there. We would like to thank our greeter today, Bob DeZerko, our acolyte, Grant George, and Stella Beagle for the flowers and treats. Please review the announcements in your bulletin. And do we have any other announcements that anyone would like to make? Andrew. wants to come. And so we have three possible um, uh, dates here. And so I made a sign-up sheet here, and it has three different options. Uh, the first option would be um, at adult Sunday school time on Sunday, so that would be before uh, service. Um, the second choice would be every other Sunday after service. And last, it would be Thursday night at 6.30 uh, p.m. So I'll put this out there somewhere. And all you have to do is just make a little star or an X on one of these choices, and hopefully we can get this uh, going. So thank you. Stella? Bill? I just want to say thank you to all those who went to my school uh, to uh, uh, thank everybody for helping out and I just want to say uh, you know, for everything I've learned and everything you do, I just want to say thank you very, very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Any other announcements? Yes, Melissa. Any other announcements? Okay, well then let us continue with our call to worship. Our hearts are steadfast. Oh God, our hearts are steadfast. We will sing, yes, we will sing praises. We will not fear evil tidings. Our hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Please stand and join me in our praise hymn, Soldiers of Christ Arise, number 756.
You may have seen it. Uh, I had a announcement here that Grant's birthday was yesterday, so I think he wants us to sing to him. So let's sing to him. Oh. Bob? <laughs> Yesterday. Yeah, September. Any other September birthdays? Are you ready? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this gathering. And Lord, thank you for your son, um, who without him would never be able to close that gap between us and you. And so let us open our minds and our hearts to all the teaching today. And Lord, let us lift our voices and praise you. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. amen. And let us turn to holy, 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 which is on page 2, and it's going to be verses 1 and 2. And stand. All right, you may be seated. And now, let's see. Since Grant is older now, he's delegated the responsibility of running around with the box. Inside your bulletins, you're going to have a piece of paper, and you can write down your prayer requests and um, pass them to Grant. And after that, they'll be prayed over prayed over and sent out. And while he goes around, we're going to sing our hymn, which is God is So Good on page number 75, verses 1 and 2. Let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift up these prayer requests to you. Lord, without your help, 
we would just be spinning around here just lost. So Lord, we'd ask if you would just hear these requests and fulfill them based on your will. And Lord, there's all kinds of things out there. There's financial stuff, there's health stuff. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. You know what's going on down here. So we would just ask that if the fulfillment of this prayer comes later on, that we would just be patient and trust that whenever you do answer, and you will answer, that it'll be the best outcome for everybody. And Lord, we pray in Christ's name, amen. scripture reading today is from Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14. Uh, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly. While we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us for all in quinity and uh, purify for him and all people of his own who are zealous and good, and good deeds. Do we have uh, children for a time of sermon? Uh, children's time. Do we have any kids today? That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Duh. Hallelujah. Oh, excuse me. I have the George children. Good, I'm going to take you and run away. Mm-hmm. What? Wait. Are you interrupting me again? Yes, I am. Before we have our children's message, how about if we sing one of our VBS songs? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> yes. I'm going to sing. And you know what? All of you out here are children, too, so you can help us. And I think we'll sing Jesus in the morning. Oh, man. Oh, I was ready for the other Jesus. one. Have you ever said these words? That's not fair. Mm-hmm. I have a day. Mm-hmm. A day? Yes. Fifteen. Mm-hmm. What would make life fair for you? Go ahead, tell me. Ice cream. Ice cream. Mm-hmm. Ice cream in the morning, ice cream at noontime, ice cream till the sun goes yes. down? Yeah. Okay, cool. Have you ever, have you, has your mom ever done to you what I did to my girls one time? They told me they wanted ice cream every meal. I don't know. So I fed them ice cream every meal. What? 
So after the second day, they said, Dad, can we have something else? No! Why, Dad? Because you wanted ice cream every meal. Well, Dad, that's not fair! That's what they told me. But they wanted ice cream. But they got tired of it. I want pizza. You want pizza every meal? No. Breakfast, lunch, no, and dinner? No, 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 no. Have pizza for breakfast every Wednesday and Thursday? Well, not no. breakfast, no. But dinner. 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 Yeah. Because our friend Deanna comes over and she, she's a picky eater, so we get pizza or something that she likes. Oh, wow. Chicken nuggets. Chicken nuggets? Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm cooking this afternoon at home. Can I come over? Sure, I don't care. Mm, I'm joking. You're joking? Yeah. Oh. Well, I'm not. My girls were mad at me because it wasn't fair that I was feeding them ice cream all the time. Well, it's not fair when you, when, you, when you give them something all the time and they don't want it anymore. But you see, here's the thing. They wanted it. And see, what we think that would make life fair really doesn't make life fair. What makes life... And, and you ask all the adults out here, can, can all the adults raise their hands so we know who you are? I know her. Oh, gee, some of you didn't raise your hands. I understand now. <laughs> anyway, if you ask them what makes life fair, they'll tell you life isn't fair. But God is. God is always fair. We don't like the answer sometimes. It's like mom and dad. How many of you like broccoli? Yeah. See, I, I, never broccoli. Liked, I never liked broccoli until this year. No, I love it with cheese because I like it melting. I like it with butter. Ew. Oh, it's good. Do you like asparagus? Huh? You like asparagus? Yeah. Me too. I don't even know what that is, actually. I do. It's in little things that look like spears. But you see, up until this year, I didn't like green vegetables at all. Hey, do you like, um, what are they called? Again? I like you. Brussels sprouts. They're not my favorite, but I'll eat them. Because when you get to the point like I am, the way I eat, you'll eat anything that's good for you. Huh, Mom? <laughs> A lot of things I never ate before that I eat now. But here's the thing. Life isn't fair. We'd like to have cookies, cake. I don't like cookies. Oh, man. Mrs. Taylor, Mrs. Taylor makes the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. She really, 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 really does. And you know what? I can't eat them. Why? Because they, they have grain in them, the flour. And see, I quit eating that. So it's not fair that you all get to eat chocolate chip cookies and I don't, right? She makes the best cookies ever. Well, it's my choice, isn't it? You see, sometimes we make choices. Wait a minute, who again? Mrs. Yeah. Taylor, Auntie Ann. She makes the best chocolate chip cookies in all the world because she puts a special ingredient in. What? Peanut butter. Hey, my mom made one of that. Yeah, probably stole the recipe. No, she taught her that. Oh, okay. But you see, life is not fair because sometimes we make bad choices. We make bad choices all the time. Does that mean that it, if we make good choices that life will be fair? No because there's always someone out trying to trip you up. But God will never trip you up. God lives in you so that you can live through those problems. Can you remember that for me? So he follows your heart like ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Mm-hmm. And you know who gives you the ba-boom, ba-boom? I know. Okay. God, God does. I, I knew that. I know you did. That's why you're such a great person to have up here every Sunday morning. Hey, but my mom... I know, your mom thinks you're a little bit out there. No, well, she thinks I'm crazy because I am. And I love being crazy. See, you get along well with me because the Bible says that we're peculiar. And that's something I don't have to practice and life ain't fair, but God is. Can you remember that? Okay, we'll see you later.
Would the ushers come forward, please, and we'll receive our morning offering. we ask you to bless these gifts, tithes, and offerings. Father, as you pass them to us, as we receive them from those who offer them, may there be a return blessing a hundredfold. Father, not just in kind, but in deed and action also. That God, today, we would be blessed to be cheerful givers. We pray, God, that you would make us wise stewards Lord, that you would help us to always be giving cheerfully. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we I want to thank you all for accepting and answering the divine appointment that God set for you to be here today. Now, I know that you look around and you think, what's the matter with you, dummy? Well, there are some people in here that if you ask about me, they'd say, I always look at the glass as half full rather than half empty. To me, numbers have nothing to do with what the Spirit of God is about to do today. So I just want you to be prepared for a great and awesome blessing. Okay? I want to start in the book of 1 Thessalonians. I believe it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles with you, please open and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. And I want you to hear what it says. Therefore, 
You all know what therefore is therefore? Therefore, comfort one another and edify, no, I'm sorry, yeah, and edify one another just as you also are doing. Now that's King James English, and it sounds a little hard to understand and maybe a little contrived in itself, but I want you to hear it from the translation that I like best. Okay, I want you to hear it from this translation. Comfort each other, dudes, because when you do, you'll be comforted. That's the first book of Beagle. That's me. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Comfort each other. Comfort each other. Little Bobby's been through some real tough times here recently. And he doesn't know it. But I've been praying for him constantly. Do me a favor. Would you do me a favor? Sure. Thank you. Stand up. Stand up, Janet. John, stand up. Please. Janet, or Jan, stand up. This is our diaconate board. They are the folks in our church that work on spiritual things. They try to keep me in line. And they do a terrible job. That's why I wear a tie now once in a while. Not because they said so, but they pray for you. They are the, the deacons of our church, or deaconesses. But they have a great responsibility. And let me tell you something. Without them, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I want you, the folks that are here right now, to give them a big round of applause. John Riley, you are very important, and I need you. Robert Zirko, you are very important, and I need you. Janet Grimes, you are incredibly important, and I need you. Jan Stack, you are important, and I need you. You guys can be seated. Jack Ellingham, would you stand up? Kim Grimes, would you stand up? Joyce, would you step inside here just a minute? This is part of our trustee board. They take care of everything that goes on here. And without them, building would probably have fallen down a hundred years ago. <laughs> they take good care of it. They do, and, and they have your interest at heart. They work hard on the budget every year. Jack Ellingham, you're important to me, not just because you mow the grass. Kim Grimes, you're important to me, not just because you take the, 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 the recyclables home, but because you're who you are. Joyce, you're important to me, not just to keep me straight in all the meetings that I go to. This is my third wife, by the way. That's my first, that's my second, that's my third. She, she makes sure I stay straight in all the meetings. But this is your trustee board, and there's two missing. No, one missing, two missing. Who's missing? Doug. Doug's missing. Doug Kaiser is our chairman, and he's not here today. Beth Kaiser is our uh, treasurer. Sam Arconin, would you stand up? He's part of the financial, he's the financial secretary of our, of our church, and he takes care of our finances. And he said to me today, Bill, what are we going to do? And I looked at him and said, it's God's problem, not mine. No, I didn't say that, but it is God's problem. Give our trustee board and our financial board a round of applause. You guys can be seated. Thank you. When was the last time you heard a pastor have their board stand up and thank them publicly? We need to do that more and more and more often. Oh, by the way, 
Okay. Um, if you want to serve on a board, please check out there. There are boards, there are positions open and available. I'm not politicking for you to get on a board, but I'd like for you to think about being involved more than that. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I'm looking for one key person in my arsenal of people. I need an audiovisual person who will run the sound and, and, and click back and forth between cameras for me so I don't have to go up there and do it and then set it static and come down here and do this. But I'm praying that God will open that up for someone to want to have that as a ministry because it's a great ministry. Encourage one another. Build one another up. I cannot run the Plymouth Congregational Church by myself. In 1961, at the age of 38, there was a girl who decided she was overweight. She'd been overweight all of her life. Does anybody know who I'm going to talk about? She was in New York City. And after 10 weeks of going to a New York City-sponsored class on how to lose weight, she lost 10 pounds in 10 weeks. So she decided, I need to do something. So she said, let's, let's bring some of my friends there so we can keep each other accountable. Didn't happen. They wouldn't go. It's too far away. It's sort of like going to church, you know? Would you go to church? Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Do you know, we've been in the ministry almost 45 years now. Do you know how many people have said to me, I'm, I want to come to your church. If half of the people that said they wanted to come to our church came to our church, there wouldn't be enough room for people to sit in here today. But I thank you for keeping the appointment that God made for you to be here today. Because I want today to give you something that God gave me yesterday and this morning. This woman, after years of teaching this in her own class, in her own home, developed a $4 billion business called Weight Watchers. Can you imagine $4 billion? I, I, the number boggles my mind. I can't imagine $4 million, let alone $4 billion. That's B with a B, you know, billion with a B. Cookbooks, portion control meals, food products, everything else. And in 1984, she retired. In 1984, she retired as one of the wealthiest women in the nation. The science of weight loss has evolved over the years but the core of her program is still valid today. It's support. It's support. Any of you know what AA is? Do any of you know what Al-Anon is? Do any of you know what CR is? Celebrate Recovery. All of those things have become common words in our society today for one reason. Support. Support one another. And you know, that's the very thing that runs through the very core of the Bible. It tells us that we are in this together. We're in this together. Hmm. We're not going it alone. We're to help one another along the journey, which includes loving one another, praying for one another, caring for one another, bearing one another's burdens even if you can't sing well. Our choir director would love to have you in the choir. You say, yeah, but I want to be, I want to be good. <clears throat> well, I gave that up years ago and I just allowed. That's all it is. Jan said amen. Today we add another ingredient to loving, praying, caring, bearing, we had an ingredient called encouragement and building up. Thessalonians writes and says this, Therefore encourage one another, build each other up, as indeed you have done. Let me ask you something. 
How many, uh, Peter, I know you're a runner. Now you're a biker more than a runner, but that's okay. Anybody run races? Anybody have friends that run races? We have Christy uh, Wood, uh, Ryan. She runs marathons now, 26 miles. Do you know there, there's, there comes a point in running a marathon, when you get to this point, it's called running into the wall. You know what happens when you run into the wall? You want to quit. You want to give up. But that, when you figure out where that is, you get people that you know to stand there. When you get there, they're encouraging you. You say, come on, you can do it. You can go. And you can make it one more inch. Come on, you can go. How many of you have ever said amen in a sermon? Can I tell you something? Don't say it in my sermons. Please, don't say it in my sermons because it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. It gets me so fired up that I, I might preach a longer than my allotted time. And if you say amen more than once, I'm going to think, golly, they're listening to what I'm saying. And if you say it two or three times, you're going to be encouraging your preacher to be a better preacher than he was yesterday. But I don't, I'm, I'm not talking about me today. I'm talking about you. When was the last time you heard anybody play like this woman does? Wow. Oh, <laughs> I didn't say that. See, you take after your pastor. He sings loud. But you also play good. I wish I played half as good as her. When was the last time you said to one of our board members, man, I'm glad you're there doing a good job. When was the last time you said to someone, anyone, thanks for caring. Thanks for praying for me. Thanks for doing the things that you do. Thanks just for being you, Bob. Because I'll tell you what, every time I see him, I'm encouraged. I know he's going through... <laughs> Have you ever been through? You know what that is, don't you? You go through every day. But when you get through it, if there's somebody there to wipe it off of you, then you can go through it again. You say, but I don't want to go through some of the things I've been through again. I don't either. That's why I don't believe in reincarnation. Who wants to go through zits again? Who wants to go through potty training again? I don't want to go through any of that stuff. Not only is it not scriptural, it's just one of them things that we just don't, don't want to have part of. But you see, one of my less, lesser faults, I hate going to the gas station. Two reasons. I just think that my car ought to run, my truck ought to run forever without putting gas in it. And the price of gas now I don't like anyway. It's coming down, isn't that wonderful? How many of you remember when it was less than a quarter? And check the, the air in your tires. And it was called full service. Now it's self-service. Sort of like what's happened in the world today. It's all become self-oriented. But you see, the one thing I know that I, I detest doing that, and I detest taking my propane cylinder to the place and having it filled. Now they have exchanges. Well, you pay $6 to have it filled, $19 to exchange it. What is this? So you go get it filled. That's why I have four cylinders at home. I have three 20-pounders and a 35-pounder. I just don't like doing it. But you see, the thing of it is, we run out of gas once in a while. Has anybody ever run out of gas in your car? Not on a date, Bob. Come on. Wayne, I heard you two ran out of gas on your honeymoon. And, I, and, and then I believe there was a little chuckle after that as if it was planned. But cars run out of gas. Gas grills run out of gas. 
John, have you ever run out of gas? Not in your car, your truck, but you personally? Have you ever run out of gas to the point where you just didn't think you could go another step and somebody come along and patted you on the head and said, ah, it'll be okay, come on, let's go together. When things look so disgusting and so discouraging and just falling apart and everything looks terrible and somebody comes along and says, man, we're going to make it, come on. All of a sudden you get one of these. And, and that little thing comes back in your eye. Not the moat and not the speck. But it's the glimmer, it's the gleam, it's the excitement. And you go, wow, we can make it. I see you took me to my word. Nobody's going to amen nothing. We all have a fuel tank. And some people fill our fuel tanks. John fills mine every time we, have, we get together. He just encourages me. He does. Bob does the same thing. Jan, on the other hand, she's always kicking me. Can't you pick out better songs? You know? She blew me away. Uh, for the nursing homes, I do. And she says, every time we finish the nursing home, she looks at me and says, I didn't know one of them. She wants me to pick out them old Lutheran hymns. Well, I ain't no Lutheran, so I, I don't know what they are anyway. I want to, I want to share a, a, a story with you that I, that I found. Gregory of Nyassa, one of the early church fathers in the 4th century, painted a beautiful picture called the tank filler. No, it's not what it was called. But that's what I called it. <clears throat> this is what he writes about the picture. At a horse race, the spectators, intent on victory, <clears throat> cheer on their favorites. And they usually do it from a, a high vantage point. You know, the grandstands, you know? They up there where they can see the whole racetrack. And they go, come on, get them, go, 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 get them, get them, go, 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 get them. And everybody goes, no, nobody looks at that guy like he's nuts, do they? They're all hollering for their horse. Number three, come on, number three, come on, number seven, come on, come on. And they get all that out of their system, and guess what? Only one horse wins. They're, they're cheering the jockey on. They're saying, give him the spurs, hit him harder, pull, give him the reins, do whatever it is. Just make him win so I can win. Here's what he says. The spectators intent on victory shout to their favorites in the contest. From the balcony, they incite the rider to keener effort, urging the horse on while leaning forward and flailing the air with their outstretched hands instead of a whip. With that picture in mind, he says, I seem to be doing the same thing myself, most valuable friend and brother. While you are completing, competing admirably in the divine race, straining constantly at the prize for the heavenly calling, I exhort you, I challenge you, I push you, I want you to go faster and farther and be victorious. In other words, he says, I'm up in the stands watching you run the race. I see you hit the wall, and I'm cheering you on. This is your life. This is your race. God is with you. So don't stop. Keep running the race. Some people do that for us, don't they? Some people encourage us along the line. They're what we ought to call balcony people. Maybe one of these days we'll put you all up in a balcony. Because every one of you that's here today is one of those encouragers to me. Then we also have the other people in our lives. The ones who look at us and say, that horse can't win. That car can't win. That driver can't win. Those people can't win. Those people at Plymouth can't build a big church and build a church for God because they're too stubborn. They're too goofy. They got a dumb pastor. I don't care what, what you got. These people are joy challenged, dream squashing, and fault finding. But we're called to love them. 
But we've got to guard ourselves against them, don't we? What happens if you spend time with a negative person day in and day out? Troy, stop that. <laughs> what, happens if you, what happens if you eat a steady diet of just a little piece of arsenic? Just a little every day. My dad worked on a murder case in Ohio. He was a, the head investigator on it. Hattie McGee was her name, and she killed her husband. But she killed him over time. And she had poisoned him little by little, and they couldn't figure it out until Dad told them, let's find out, let's, let's see what his body says. This was way before autopsies was the great thing, right? So they did some liver stuff, and they did some other things that they figured, I don't know what all they did. But they found out that she had poisoned him over a three-year period. And guess what? That's exactly what happens when every day somebody says, you can't. You can't do it. You can't make it. You can't succeed. You can't learn. You can't sing. You can't be. You can't do. Every time we take that in, Donnie, if, if Jim would have told you that all through your convalescence, where would you be today? He kept st sitting behind you. I saw him. Come on, you can do it, honey. Be careful. You can do it. And he, where did he stand? Behind her and alongside of her. Where did Stella stand when she had her knees done? Where did I stand with her? I took care of her. I helped her. Why? Because I was married to her? No, because I loved her. Because God did that to me. You see... One of the things I want you to look at or, or to understand is God's plan for us is to become balcony people, encouragers. How can I say such a thing? I can say it because the very person who the word encouragement comes from. Anybody ever heard? Listen to this. Acts chapter 4, verse 36. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus. Joseph was his name, to whom the apostles gave the nickname or gave the name Barnabas, which means, anybody know what Barnabas means? Son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, and then he brought the money and he laid it down at the apostles' feet. Notice the nickname, son of encouragement. He was a Levite. You know what that meant? That meant that he was a priest helper. How many helpers did we have today in our service? We had Sam, the lay leader. We had Jan playing the organ. We had Andrew doing the preliminaries of the service. We had uh, Adam read the scripture. We had the ushers take the offering. I suppose you all would, would be okay if I played the organ, led the service, did the reading, did all that stuff, then took the offering myself and came back down and set everything on it, and then turned around and preached. Now, would that be okay? I can't do it all. I can't do it without you. You here are the most important people in this church. The pastor's not. You can get a pastor anywhere. The board members aren't. You can elect anybody to the board. The pews aren't. The organ's not. The sound system's not. Who are the, what is the most important people in our church? Who are they? It's you. You are the most important thing that God has put in my life, other than her and my grandchildren. Oh, the kids come someplace down the line. I tell everybody, you don't know what, what it's like to have a grandkid. And them kids take second, second fiddle, or third, or fourth. See, we'd expect Barnabas to be sour, because he was called a Hellenist. Do you know what, what that meant? That meant that he was excluded from serving. That meant he was excluded from serving with the Levites because he was born outside of Israel. He wasn't allowed to serve. You know what he was allowed to do? Nothing. Unless he went back home. <clears throat> but he's in Jerusalem. And he won the eye of the apostles because he did something so remarkable that they caught what he did. 
he sold his property and said, Apostles, I don't want anything. Here's my money. Do with it what you please. No strings. Nothing attached. And then they began to look at him and see him and watch him. As a result of his financial gifts, the disciples said to each other, His name's not adequate. We need to name him something else. Barnabas, son of encouragement, balcony boy. I like that term better than any of them, balcony boy. You see, generosity does that sometimes. Whether you're generous with your money or your time or your interest or your faith or your trust or your encouragement, do we want people to be encouragers or do we want them to be, well, you know. Them old diaconate people, they just get everything wrong. Or them old trustees, they're only interested in one thing. We're all interested in the same thing here, folks. We're interested in the kingdom of God. I'm not interested in the diaconate's agenda or the trustee's agenda. I'm not interested in the mission board's agenda. I'm interested in one thing, the kingdom of God. And what's the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? That's all of us being balcony boys, saying, John, good job with the kids. Man, I can't wait until the quarterly meeting. I can't wait to see what he's going to have this time. Because I know, and I know that I know, because I know down inside my knower that God has already started working on him for what's going to be this, this time. I'll probably embarrass him. He'll get mad and never come back. But Troy wants to do missions work with our kids. Take them to a mission field. Oh, I'm not talking about Africa or Somalia or over where Ebola is. I'm talking about going to West Virginia or Kentucky, you know. Some places that need somebody to come and say, Jesus loves me, this I know. Do you know there's a lot of people today in America that don't know that? You say, how can that be? Everybody doesn't live where you do. Everybody doesn't have a church to go to like you do. Many children today are brought up in homes that the only way they talk about God is using his name as a swear word. Many children today live in the ghetto where if they get a meal, it's because either someone gave it to them or they stole it. They don't have a concept of who Jesus Christ really is. But can I tell you something? To take our kids and let them get a taste firsthand of what it's like to help someone beyond themselves. For our missions committee to look beyond our four and no more is what it's all about. You see, that's what it is. You see, but I want you to see what happened to Barnabas. Barnabas was this wonderful guy of encouragement. And the apostles, all of a sudden, here comes in town this guy named Paul. You look an awful, like, an awful lot like Saul of Tarsus. Who are you? Well, you know, I used to be Saul of Tarsus, but I was on the road to Damascus going down to arrest people and persecute them. And the Lord came to me and blinded me, and I, I had a conversion experience on the road to Damascus. I'm now a Christian. What do you think the apostles said to him? Okay, sure you did. You remember the little commercial that used to be on television? Give it to Mikey, he'll eat anything. Here's what I see. The apostles. Call in that Barnabas guy. If he can put up with him, he might be okay. So Barnabas starts going around with Saul. Paul. 
And guess what? When they, on their first missionary journey, it was Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. And Saul learned at the feet of Barnabas. And you know what Saul learned? How to be an encourager. How to help people out of their doldrums. He got a little bit testy occasionally when he preached some of the messages that he did. But he learned from Barnabas. And you know what? The next missionary journey they went out, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Or Saul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas. The next missionary, it was Saul all by himself. But you see, Barnabas said, after spending a whole missionary tour with him, he says, you know what? That guy's okay. He's a real Christian. He got really saved. Oh, my goodness, really? Yeah. He got what you got. He's got, now wait a minute, he can't have what I got because I was baptized in the Jordan River. Where was he baptized? On the road to Damascus. Well, he can't have what I got. I was baptized by Jesus. No, you weren't. Jesus didn't baptize anybody, so don't lie to that. He says, well, well they, he can't have what we got because we were in the upper room and we got the Holy Ghost. If that's the only place to get the Holy Ghost, then those of us who are here today are in real trouble. Because I've been filled with the Holy Ghost and ain't ashamed to tell you about it. And let me tell you something. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost too. Paul said, it's real. Barnabas attested it was real. And then guess what happened? They let him in. They let him be a part of it. You see, my favorite example of this comes a few years later after they, they went around and Paul and Barnabas got in a big argument. Did you know that? Listen to what it says. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we have proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. And Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark. But Paul said, No, I don't want to have him with me because he deserted me in Pamphylia and had not, accompli had not accompanied them in the work. They disagreed. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas. Remember the third missionary journey? Paul and Silas? And set out. The believers communicating, uh, commending them, him to the grace of the Lord. All that to tell you this. Barnabas never gave up on Mark. You know who John Mark turned out to be? The guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark in the Bible. And you know what's so unique about that? Because Matthew and Luke both used his Gospel as an outline. That's why those two are so full and Mark is so empty. Mark just has the details. They've got the flowering things. But you see, Barnabas never gave up. But, let me tell you, neither did Paul. Paul didn't give up on Mark. I want you to listen to what he said here. He says, in uh, 1 Timothy, he says, Only take with us, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is helpful my ministry. 2 Timothy 4.11 Barnabas saw something in Mark and turned out to be right all along. I see something in you and I know that I'm right. I know that I'm right because the truth about me is I'm not a quitter. And I hope you're not either. I believe you're not because I believe you're here today. I want to share this little bit, then I'll quit. John, John Mark gets up at Paul's funeral. I want you to think about uh, Barnabas' funeral. Barnabas' funeral. I wonder what it was like. Man gets up to speak and everybody nudges each other and says, that's the apostle Paul. I spoke at a lady's funeral in Gal Police, Ohio. I'm sitting down with the pallbearers. I wasn't intended to have because the truth about me is I'm not a quitter, and I hope you're not either. I believe you're not, because I believe you're here today. 
I want to share just a little bit, then I'll quit. John, John Mark gets up at Paul's funeral. I want you to think about uh, Barnabas's funeral. Barnabas's funeral. I wonder what it was like. Man gets up to speak and everybody nudges each other and says, that's the apostle Paul. I spoke at a lady's funeral in Gal Police, Ohio. I'm sitting down with the pallbearers. I wasn't intended, hadn't intended, wasn't supposed to speak. And standing on the, the dais doing a, a sermon was Tommy Barnett. Now, I know you all don't know who Tommy Barnett is, but Tommy Barnett uh, developed a ministry called the 721 Ministry in New York, and he's responsible for thousands of people coming to Christ. Then there was another man stood up and spoke. His name was Demas Shakarian, and I know that none of you know who he is, but Demas Shakarian was the president of Full Gospel Businessmen Association worldwide. And he's up there preaching, and the, the funeral's over with, and they're calling the pallbearers up, and the man who was the church it was in, he says, but wait, sit down. We have one more speaker to speak. I said, yeah. And they said, we've got to have Bill Beagle come up here. Huh? I mean, there was bishops from the Methodist Church. There was bishops from the Episcopal Church. There was Catholic priests there. And they said, Bill Beagle's got to come up here. I had a chance to speak at one of the dearest friends of ours, her funeral and share the fact that because of Christine Epling and her encouraging me, never, ever, ever give up, that I stood before that congregation as a pastor called of God, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Because one, actually three women in my lives, my life, believed in me, my mother, my wife, and Christine Epling. And without their encouragement, I would have died a drug addict, 330 pound nut, probably before I was 30. But because of their encouragement, and folks, I want to encourage you today, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't even think about it. Because one of the worst words that I've ever heard in the English language is discouragement. I don't know if any of you have been discouraged this week, but I spent two days in discouragement. And all of a sudden, God gave me this message. And he reminded me those three encouragers in my life, three people who never, never spoke discouragement to me. Pray with me, please. God, I just pray that our boards, our committees, Lord, will have encouragement today. Not looking at figures and numbers, but looking as you look, Father, at our hearts. And God, as I pray right now in the name of Christ, our Savior, I ask you to fill everyone with hope and encouragement. For God, today, 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 is the best day of our lives because we woke up able to breathe and walk and talk, able to love you. As we come to a conclusion today, I ask you, God, that you would fill each of us with hope and encouragement and, God, that our resolute decision today Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28 that you will go with us wherever we go and God that if you're with us 
pray tell who can be against us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with me and sing our closing hymn, I Have Decided. Father, your word says that anyone that puts his hand to the plow and turns back is not fit. God, we're not turning back. We're not stopping. We're not looking back to, to see what we could have done, what we should have, ought have, and might have. But God, we're going forward today with the encouragement of your spirit and the encouragement of our brothers and sisters in Christ that God, if you be for us, who can be against us? We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will minister your grace and peace to us now in Christ's name. Father, may your face shine upon us, grant us your peace, and may you be with us in all the things we do. For we pray in Christ's name. Everyone said, Amen.